We are in the midst of the 150th anniversary of the Civil War, and we're really kind of right in the middle of it. Today we're going to talk about the first Minnesota Volunteer Infantry. I thought I'd start out by telling you a little bit about how I got interested in this period of history. It dates back to my youth. Uh, my mother early on informed me that I had a great-great-grandfather who fought during the Civil War, and he died during the war in the South. And about uh, 1973, the same year I got married, I joined along with some other fellows and we formed a club called the First Minnesota Volunteer Infantry, Infantry Reenactment Unit. We wanted to dedicate ourselves to the reenacting the life of the most famous of the Minnesota regiments and enjoyed over the years uh, building a reputation as the original veterans did of being one of the finest, in this case, reenactment groups in the country. We enjoyed uh, making some movies like Dances with Wolves and Glory and a few others. One of the reenactors is here today. It's good to see you again. And uh, as time went on, I was collecting artifacts. It, 20 years ago, another fellow and I started a website dedicated to the men. And after a few years, uh, I was writing the stories. He created the website, and I wrote the stories about the men. Spent a lot of time at the National Archives. Uh, relatives would email me when they would see information and they would add information. And a lot of them would say, I never knew this about my grandfather. But eventually, as time went on, I said, you know, I'm not going to be here forever. I don't know how long that will be, but when I'm gone, I don't know how long the website will be up, so I want to have something that uh, others can read from and, and enjoy. I had heard that a lot of teachers have used it at, uh, the website as a resource when they were teaching their kids the section on Minnesota history. And so the book came into mind. And after this 20 years of research and four years of writing, this is the result. I was saying to somebody earlier, we'll have a nice conversation now, and I hope things are of interest to you and the stories sound good. And if they don't sound good, I'll try to make up something that does sound good. <laughs> but let's, uh, let's, let's take a look at the, the men of the first Minnesota and find out who they were. Before the war, Minnesota, the people that came to Minnesota primarily came here to either farm or to work in the logging industry. When the war started, one third of the men from Minneapolis and the larger community of St. Anthony and from Stillwater were in the logging industry. Why had the people come to Minnesota? Well, many of them came to have a better life than where they had been before. For the farmers, it was a place to get their own land, to raise a family, raise crops to feed their family, and to sell. For many of them, it was a, like a Garden of Eden in the West. One woman, in fact, upon in riding a wagon uh, to the crest of a hill, looked out on the prairie and considered it to be the Prairie of Eden. That name stuck. And that today that community is called Eden Prairie. Those who came to Minnesota were hardworking and rugged because they had to be, they had to be to survive. They had a fort here called Fort Snelling, but by 1860 it was no longer needed. The frontier pushed west, and the fort had been sold to a private owner who was using it to graze sheep. But they did hold the 1860 State Fair here. April 12th comes along, 1861. At 4.30 in the morning, Sumter is attacked and surrenders the next day. But the government is totally unprepared. The government has 16,000 men in the army, and most of them are out in the west guarding the frontiers, the frontier outposts. Governor Ramsey is in Washington trying to curry favors for the new, new state of Minnesota, founded in 1858, just a couple of years earlier. He heads over to visit his friend Simon Cameron that morning, and Cameron tells him of what's happening, what has happened at Sumter, and that they're not quite sure just what they're going to be doing because of the troop situation. Ramsey volunteers 1,000 men, and Cameron says, go write that down, for I'm on my way to see the president. Ramsey sat down, wrote out his Tender of 1,000 men, Cameron folded it, put it in his pocket, went on to see the president, and thus the first Minnesota becomes known as the first troops tendered for the Union cause during the Civil War. I want to take a moment to 
encourage you all to go up to the exhibit, two floors above, because there you will be able to see the tender of troops that Alexander Ramsey wrote out and gave to Sam Simon Cameron. And I'll tell you a quick story behind the story. Uh, when MHS found that uh, it, the tender still existed, it's at the National Archives, the National Archives agreed to let it be brought out here for the display, but they did not FedEx it. They had it hand couriered, hand flown out and delivered for this exhibit. It's truly a wonderful historic piece, so please do look for it, and if you don't see it, ask for it. So, recruiting rallies are held throughout the state. Men headed to Fort Snelling, both singly and in groups. Fort Snelling Round Tower, Round Tower can be seen, and that's the only existing part of the fort still out there uh, today. The rest is all a recreation, but it's according to the original blueprints. Bands played music and, and patriotic speeches were given at these times. The men would say, well, they just want us for three months. Remember, it was a 90-day enlistment. We'll be back in time for the fall harvest. It'll be an adventure. And the men rushed forward to enlist. <clears throat> Company G was born on April 24, 1861, at a meeting at the Metropolitan Hotel in Faribault. A patriotic rally was held, and men stepped forward to sign a form that was four feet in length. The enrollment form was submitted the next day, and on April 25th, the volunteers were accepted as the regiment's sixth company. They were taken in the order that they tendered their services, and so the sixth company became known as Company G. But who were these men of the first Minnesota? From the start of the war through its conclusion, the men of the first were somewhat larger than life. The average height of the Civil War soldier was five foot eight inches. Though some of the first had some notable exceptions, several of the enlisted men were 6'2 or taller. Captains Colville at 6'5 and Captain Downey at 6'3 would have been notable giants as they led their men. But the perception of who they were carried, carried themselves from the early part of the war. And a part of it, I think, was from who they were here. Being pioneers, they had to know how to shoot, how to raise food on their own, how to build a home, how to defend themselves if need be. Those who were loggers had to, knew, knew, had to know how to swing an ax, fell a tree, and work summer and winter. They had a pioneering confidence that, made them, that may have come from having learned to survive in this frontier country. Here's a quote from the Chicago Tribune as the troops pass through Chicago. There are few regiments we have ever seen that can compare to the brawn and muscle of the Minnesotians, used to the ax, the rifle, the oar, and the setting pole. They are unquestionably the finest body of troops that has yet appeared on our streets. This was a quote from a uh, colonel after the war who had commanded a Massachusetts regiment. He says, I remember my regiment and one from Minnesota. We were ordered to build a road, and I found that the Minnesota regiment, composed as it was in the main of men accustomed in, to wielding an ax, were doing more wood chopping in one day than my regiment was in two. And speaking of the manner of the Minnesota, how they felled the trees, he said they were a regiment of large men who swung the axe breast high and cut the trees nearly through and left them standing just ready to fall. They would begin on one side and work their way thus through a lot, and on reaching the other side would fall the outer trees inward. These would communicate their fall to the other adjoining trees and so on, the whole forest falling together. The first Minnesota were great fighters as well as choppers. From the first at Bull Run, where the men were one of the last to leave the field, and when they left, they left in good order, the generals noticed that. And throughout the war, they were known as one of the men, one of the troops who could be counted on. And they always took pride in that. Who was the first to enlist in the Union? Was it Josiah King? On Monday night, a patriotic rally was held in St. Paul Armory with the Pioneer Guard, that local militia unit. 
Josias King rushed forward and said, I'll be the first to sign for the Union. But was he? Earlier that day, a telegram was delivered to Judge Willis Gorman, who was holding court in Anoka. He was the former territorial governor from, from Minnesota before it became a state. He adjourned the court and went outside to announce the message he had received about Fort Sumter and the need for volunteers. Aaron Greenwald may have heard the announcement and volunteered then, or more likely was the first to volunteer at a meeting called that either late afternoon or early evening and may have been thus the volunteer who volunteered before Josias King. How was the claim settled? Well, Greenwald died at Gettysburg. Josias King survived the war, and thus the credit goes to Josias King. <laughs> However, if you go to Anoka, they will tell you Aaron Greenwald was the first volunteer for the Union Army in the Civil War. This is Colonel Willis Gorman, who was judge residing in Anoka at the time. He was appointed the first colonel of the first Minnesota. He was a Mexican War veteran, and he enlisted as a private, eventually rising to the rank of major. He served with distinction and was cited for bravery under fire. Gorman was noted for his salty language and no-nonsense manner. I'm being polite here. <laughs> he was a strict disciplinarian who whipped the men into a tough fighting unit. They complained but when it came time to fight, they appreciated what he had done for them. He was also a practical man. The women of Minneapolis and the larger city of St. Anthony invited the men to a picnic. See, so remember, this is gonna be just 90 days and come on back. They invited the men to a picnic on May 21st. He thought it would be a good exercise for the men so, to march to the fort. So on May 21st, he sent eight companies from uh, the fort to Minneapolis. Once they got there, they waited at a suspension bridge because it couldn't handle all the weight of the men. You see here the suspension bridge with Minneapolis in the foreground and Nicollet Island in the background. As the men of Company D waited their turn to cross the bridge, a photographer set up his camera on a tripod. Seeing this, Lieutenant De DeWitt Clinton Smith ordered his men to attention and then to parade rest and the photographer took what is today the only known picture of the first Minnesota at the beginning of the war. This was taken just three weeks after they had enlisted and is a wonderful image. The men are holding model 1855 Springfield rifles with bayonets. They have been issued military leather gear. However, their underwear, socks, and woolen overshirts were purchased from a St. Paul wholesale supply house known as Culver and Farrington. They were cheap, ready-made clothing intended for the Indian trade. The shirts were of various colors, predominantly red. They also had been issued black felt hats, plus black and dark blue pants that would have been hastily sewn the week before to military specifications. Seen in the, on the far left is Sergeant Chris Heffel, uh, Chris, he oh, no, here we go. Chris Heffelfinger, can I get this going right there? See that? Do any of you recognize the name Tom Heffelfinger? That's Tom's great-great-grandfather. In front of the company stands DeWitt Smith. He purchased the picture from the photographer and later gave it to his wife. In fact, DeWitt Clinton Smith wrote to his wife and said, there's a photographer here who's taking pictures. Bring our son down and let's have our likeness taken. He was a 35-year-old farmer, uh, farmer and a postmaster in the town of Osseo. At the Battle of Antietam, which you heard about or you saw earlier in the previous video, uh, Smith was badly wounded. A mini ball entered his left hip, lodging in the pelvis about three inches from his spine. Privates Dan Sullivan and Marcus Past of Company D carried him off the field and he was taken to a hospital in Hagerstown, Maryland. Surgeon Jacob Stewart of the First Minnesota with other doctors attended to him, but the ball was never extracted. The surgeons told him that one of the nerves in his legs had been severed and produced a partial paralysis of that leg, and he had to rest until a new one would form. Melissa and her son Eugene traveled east and stayed with him to nurse him back to health. Eventually, the family returned to Minneapolis. He was never able to recover, however, and he resigned from the service in October of 63. 
back home, he was appointed the state librarian by the governor, Governor Stephen Miller, who had served in the first Minnesota. But Smith's position as state librarian didn't last long. He felt the need to return to the military and sought and received a position as a paymaster in the army. With his departure, Governor Smith, Governor Miller appointed Melissa Smith to replace her husband as state librarian. Smith was commissioned as a major in the Paymaster Corps and on February 23, 1864, reported to St. Louis for duty. In the book, you can read the interesting story of how Captain Smith unfortunately gave his life while defending a steamboat from attacking, attacking Confederates in the South. It is a stirring tribute to who he was as a person. Let's take a look at what is probably a fairly well-known picture to many of you. These are the officers in front of the Commandant's house at Fort Snelling. To the left, we see Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Miller. Right here, Willis Gorman, the salty man. Major Dyke. William Leach, the adjutant. Here is six foot three, Mark Downey, captain of Company B. You can see he's considerably taller than some of the other men. And back here is William Colville at 6'5", captain of Company F. In June, the, late, the regiment were headed east, and at, and at the start of the war, there no, were no trains in Minnesota, so they took the steamships. They boarded the War Eagle and the Northern Bell and headed down the Mississippi. Along the way, they stopped at several river towns like Hastings and Red Wing, where the soldiers got off, and family members and friends said tearful goodbyes to the men who were leaving. Many would never return, and some who did return three years later did not come back the same. They were changed men. The boats finally stopped, one at La Crosse and the other at Prairie du Chien, where they disembarked the men and loaded them on two different trains because one train couldn't handle all the men. They went as far as Janesville, where they got on one train, went to Chicago, where we rode that, heard that quote earlier, and then off to Washington. Here is a picture of some of the uh, officers at their first camp in the fall after Bull Run had occurred. We have here on the far uh, left William Farrell, who was a Mexican War veteran and actually served under, uh, was served with Willis Gorman, and Farrell died at Gettysburg. Next to him is Sam Ragu, who was a grocer from St. Paul. His brother became a Confederate officer. So here he was truly brother against brother. His brother died at Glorietta Pass in New Mexico at the only Civil War battle that fought, was fought in New Mexico. Next to him in the middle is Captain Lewis Muller, a clerk from Stillwater. He was killed at Gettysburg. First Lieutenant Charles Zirenberg was a lawyer from St. Paul. He was killed during a fight at Vienna, Virginia in 1862, just prior to the battle at Antietam. Captain Henry Coates stands on the far right. He was the senior surviving officer at Gettysburg, and he wrote the report at the end of the battle which detailed what had occurred. And he summarized by saying, it should be known that every man in the regiment did his duty. The list of the extent of our losses can, see, can be seen by the following list of killed and wounded. And it was an extensive list of over 200 men. And that's the, uh, from which the book title comes, Every Man Did His Duty. The pictures of the men on the cover are all men who gave their lives during their service with the First Minnesota. Seated is Captain Mark Downey at six foot three. He was much taller than the other men, and that's probably why they would, had him seated. Otherwise, he would have towered over them. He commanded the left wing of the regiment at Gettysburg. While there was some difficulty and tough times during the war, the men also found ways to have fun and enjoy life and find humor. Here's a quick story about the printers of the Berryville Conservator. Have you ever heard the story of the Berryville Conservator? In 1862, the first Minnesota marched into the Virginia town of Berryville. All the Confederate sympathizers had left, or the ones who were concerned about their safety, including the editor of the paper. Uh, Tom Presnell on the far left here, all these men were printers. Tom Presnell walking into town noticed the newspaper and thought it'd be interesting to see what it looked like. However, there was a guard posted at the front door. 
So being a very resourceful person, as all the first Minnesota soldiers were known to be, he walked around to the back and crawled in the window. <laughs> Once inside, he noticed that the type had been set on half the paper. Southern News, very pro-secession, very anti-Lincoln, and the other half of the paper hadn't been set yet. He thought, well, no, this is kind of interesting. So an idea occurred to him. So he went outside, found his friend Frank Mead, the second to the left there. Frank liked the idea that he came up with. So they went to talk to a few more friends of theirs because there were a lot of printers from Minnesota in the regiment. Jim, uh, Julian Kendall and Henry Lindergreen were two of them. Then they found three other friends. And they went to Colonel Gorman with the idea. Sir, we would like to print a newspaper. Gorman approved it. They went over, passed the guard, set up the type, and they left the secession side on one side, and on the other side they printed news of the 1st Minnesota Volunteer Infantry Regiment. And they had some fun with it. They slapped some fun at their uh, sutler, uh, King, for being outlandish in his prices and things like this. But they just had fun with it, and they printed the 1st Minnesota newsletter, newspaper, and this is what it looked like. This is from the archives of the Minnesota Historical Society. They sold them for five cents to a dollar, depending on what they could get for it, and they sold them out. So they printed some more the next day. In 1862, uh, well, let me mention briefly, uh, as I said earlier, throughout the war, the men had been earning a reputation of unquestioned and unfailing accountability. This is true not only in battle, but also on work details. In 1862, the Army of the Potomac needed a bridge to span the Chickahominy River to allow the Union Army to escape capture by fleeing to the safety of the other side. The Army's command turned to the 1st Minnesota to build it, and they did, using their own skills and without the help of the Corps of Engineers. Because the Corps of Engineers said, the river is too dangerous, a bridge cannot be built. General Alfred Sully, who had been the colonel of the 1st Minnesota, called on Captain Downey of Company B. Company B was from Stillwater. Most of the men from Stillwater were loggers. And he called uh, Captain Downey in. Captain Downey was sickly ill in his tent, but he responded to the general's call. And he, when the general told him what he needed, he said, General, find me a 1,000 men from the Northwest, and the bridge will be built. Of course, he meant to find me the first Minnesota. He and the men studied the river and devised a plan that would hold up under the heavy weight of the Army's wagons and horses. It was Downey who suggested using the grapevines that were hanging from the trees to lash together the, the wood logs so that there would be some play to them. That bridge was the only bridge to survive, and it's over that bridge that the Army retreated and thus was not captured by the Southerners. Downey was suffering from dysentery, and once the bridge was done, he was immediately checked into the Army Hospital, but he had done his service. Let's talk about, there's a picture of Downey. Let's talk about Gettysburg. Here's Colonel Colville, who led the regiment. He was wounded twice. Lieutenant Colonel Charles, Charles Adams was wounded three times. He commanded the right wing. Here is Downey, who was now a major by the time Gettysburg had occurred. Downey was wounded three times. Adjutant John Peller had his arm shattered during the battle. Here, this picture was, written, uh, was drawn by Josias King, the first volunteer, um, after the war, and it shows General Hancock coming up and seeing roughly 15 to 1,800 uh, Confederate, troop, Confederate troops on the far side. And there's really nobody between uh, that curtain over there and this curtain over here. Uh, a roughly a gap of about half a mile. The 1st Minnesota were the only troops there. And they were being held in reserve uh, with an artillery regiment. Uh, Hancock's response was, my God, is this all we have? He turned to... Uh, Colonel Colville and said, Who is, what regiment is this? And he said, the 1st Minnesota. And Hancock says, uh, charge those colors. And the men knew immediately what their fate was. They fixed bayonets and uh, they moved forward. So here's Colville, here's Downey, uh, pictured uh, commanding the left wing. 
Here's Adams commanding the right wing of the unit, and Peller's position is to the right in command. So 262 go in, 47 come back after 15 to 20 minutes. Hancock needed about that time to bring up reserves. And he said later he knew what the outcome would be, but he needed to buy time to bring up the reserves, or it would have been a Confederate victory. And many of you know the story, so I won't get into it too much. But this is where the first Minnesota really earned their reputation, because not a man wavered. They went in, uh, and they did their duty, knowing that, uh, what the outcome would be. Lieutenant James DeGray of Company F was on the left wing when he went in to the fight. He received a bullet wound to his head. A bullet went through his hat. It's hard to see, but right there, and came out over here. So he was hit here, but it didn't penetrate his skull. It just grazed him and knocked him senseless, but did not kill him. That hat can be seen up in the display upstairs as can be the enlistment form for Company G. I didn't mention that earlier. So you will be going up there to see all these things, right? <laughs> I want to show you a couple of other things. Um, the Company K was also on the left side. In a company formation, the captain is on the far right, and behind him is his first sergeant. So Captain Piriam was moving forward in the front line. Marvin would have been right behind him. Marvin was wounded as they were moving forward, shot in the heel, and went down. Shortly thereafter, Piriam was hit in the head, a bullet going through, basically, and coming out here. Uh, they were both carried to the rear after the battle, and Marvin, Sergeant Marvin held his captain's head in his lap and bathed it and kept compresses on it for quite some time as he was, became delirious and continually... Um, gave orders to the men and was trying to rally the men and save them. Um, uh, Piriam died um, two days later. This was the sword Piriam was carrying in the battle. It's pictured in the book. It was presented to him by the first color bearer at, uh, of the first Minnesota. And over here are, you can see it very hard to see, but it's engraving as all the battles that he served in. This is, uh, these are pictures of Marvin's canteen, Matthew Marvin's canteen, that he used during the war and the frock coat that he wore at the end of the war when he was recovering. It doesn't show sergeant stripes. Uh, this is a coat that was given to him after he was recovering. Uh, that canteen can be seen upstairs as well. We all know about the battle, and then we hear about how Lee left, and the Union Army went after him, of course. But do we ever think about what happens after a battle? You've got thousands of artifacts laying on the ground. You've got horses, carcasses decaying. You've got wounded all over. There's a lot to think about that we, that's not the pretty part of war, but I think it's important that we understand, and those of you who are veterans, I think, certainly understand, there's a lot of not, not really glorious things to war as well. Sergeant Buckman, was detailed early in the morning of July 2nd, before the charge, to take 20 men and report to the surgeon at the Second Corps Hospital, located behind Little Round Top. He took those men, and they headed off. He said later that that detail probably saved their lives, because so many of the men who did, did go into battle didn't survive. During the intensity of the fighting, he and the others at the core hospital, as they were trying to serve the wounded and take care of them, started receiving shelling from the uh, Confederate artillery. And so they decided to move the hospital back. They moved it back a mile to a place called Rock Creek. If you go out to Gettysburg, ask your guide to take you to Rock Creek. And he'll go, oh, you know about that. Rock Creek uh, was, had a small creek, but it had some fresh water, so they thought it would be good, and they started moving the troops back there. As he started moving the troops, he stepped backward and stepped on a stretcher, at, and he, was, he found that the stretcher held Ludwell Mosher, 
from his own company, G. Mosier had been shot three times in the hip, the thigh, and the wrist, and was lying in a lot of pain. Buckman's comments later were, he greeted me with a welcome that I shall never forget. Well, I can bet that any man who's got three wounds in him, when he sees a friend like that, he says, boy, am I glad to see you. This is what the Second Corps Hospital at Rock Creek looked like. On July 4th, the wounded were still being brought in, covered with dirt and in need of attention, but there were just too many of them. In fact, there were over 4,000, or nearly 4,000. One surgeon carried, uh, Buckman saw one surgeon carry a young rebel to the amputation table because of 4,000 Union and Confederate soldiers. The surgeon carried this young rebel to an amputation table and he heard the young man talking to the surgeon about how he wanted to get home to see his mother and his sister. And Buckman noted that unfortunately the soldier didn't make it. On July 6th, supplies were received. Buckman was ordered along with the others to clean up the grounds. He talked, up, he talked about picking up enough body parts to pile as high as a table, and then they had to bury them. It was so hot and the people were dying so quickly that it became hard to bury them fast enough. And he said the stench became overwhelming. At one point they had to pour whiskey on their hands and rub on their faces to be able to smell that rather than what they were normally smelling. I'm gonna let it go with that. Just I think we've made the point that it was, had to be a very, very difficult and dirty and trying time. And what we have seen here Oh, I should mention also, one day he said, we spent the day making headboards. What we have seen here is that the men who went off on a lark will be home by fall, quickly learned that it wasn't going to be that much of an adventure. Pretty soon it became a job. And part of that job was caring for their friends and, and, and as they were wounded and burying them if they didn't survive. And from that was a camaraderie that was built that any veteran can probably understand. Buckman wrote, it's difficult to imagine the condition of the Second Corps Hospital for weeks after the battle. He says, truly I have something to remember, the terrible battlefield, the dusty, weary march, the long nights on picket, in storm and cold, can I forget. I wrote this book as a, in honor of these gentlemen, these men who served so long ago. Despite all the difficulties, they find, found time to have humor, as you can see from the experience with the Berryville Conservative. Whereas two years in the South seemed to be, uh, for the first two years, the South seemed to be winning the war, at Gettysburg, the war turned. And from, the, from then on, the men started winning. Hundreds of thousands of men were killed or wounded, with many carrying permanent disabilities for the rest of their lives. Many were broken from disease or stress of the hard life of the soldier and were later discharged for disability. Yet through it all, they persevered. These were men from Minnesota, and they didn't complain. They took pride in doing their duty. Whether they were chopping down trees or building bridges or laying planks to create a, what was called a corduroy road, they did their best, and they did it well. They earned a reputation for being a regiment the generals could count on when something needed to be done. When they were discharged in May of 1864, they were proud of the fact that they had never lost a flag or turned their back to the enemy. This was the first Minnesota. During this 150th anniversary of the Civil War, let us not forget what they did to help preserve the nation that we have today. Thank you. Thank you.